you made a long trek through Pine Ridge, through the wind, or, um, and I hope you're all here to uh, listen to Arthur Amiot talk about his show, his uh, career, and he has catalogs that are companions with the show that are on the back table. If anybody would like to purchase the catalogs, which are um, a wonderful companion piece to the show, purchase them at the front desk, and then when we're done, I think Arthur would be glad to sign them for you. Um, it is my privilege to, I don't need to really introduce Ruth Brennan, who was a director here for many years, one of the show that, um, Arthur's show is actually in the gallery that's named after Ruth, but she is going to introduce Arthur, and they have been uh, um, friends and colleagues for many years. So anyway, I'll turn it over to Ruth, and uh, then we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Well, I was, um, Denise said when she called me about this to, uh, that I didn't need to go on and on and on, and then she gave me Arthur's resume, and I could go on and on and on. For 53 years, he's been extremely busy in the, in the art world. And I sometimes I kind of feel like I'm um, talking to the choir here because I think you probably are all very aware of Arthur and the importance of his work and his um, all of his variety, a wide variety of accomplishments. But he is an internationally recognized visual artist. He's exhibited throughout the United States and several European countries. Primarily, I think, France and Germany, but others as well. But that his career doesn't stop there, and his talents don't stop there. So I made a list of some of the categories and all, and I may be even skipping some. But in, in addition to being a renowned visual artist, he is a writer and an author. He certainly is a historian. He's a designer of exhibits. He's a teacher and a university faculty member. He's an advisor and has been on boards and commissions uh, as a member for many throughout the country, not only in South Dakota, but, uh, uh, but all over the country. He is a panelist. He is an award recipient, a fellowship recipient, and I could go on, but that sort of summarizes um, what he's done. But, Doing all of this, he's a magnificent traveler, I'm sure. His work reflects uh, the native Lakota culture, as well as that of Northern Plains Indians through, through his contemporary media. But I think one of the things that is remarkable, he, he probably could have lived anywhere that he chose, but he has returned to his homeland and lives in Custer, and we're so happy to have him here among us. So, Without saying anything further, Arthur, my good friend, and it gives me great pleasure to uh, have you here and, and to introduce you. So, I'm going to have to go up here because I need to keep in contact with the technician. <laughs> I wish to thank you very much for coming out this evening. Uh, despite the wind and the cold. It is my honor and my privilege to, to be here, to be able to uh, visit with you. Uh, I, I'm thinking it's going to actually be a series of reflections. As uh, the work in my uh, collage series are, they are, in a sense, reflections of both a time and a place, and reflections on relationship. Many years ago, as an undergraduate student at Northern State College, uh, we had the privilege, I belonged to a, 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 a native student organization. Uh, the, the name of the organization was Moccasin Tracks. <laughs> and, uh, it was all the Indian students on campus, and we'd get together for potlucks, and uh, and we'd do cert we built a float for the homecoming parade, and uh, but we uh, we were also in touch with uh, uh, native 
senior Native scholars that we often thought of as inspirational and uh, people that had, had broken, you know, like a snowplow. They broke the way for us so that we could attend college because in 1960, 1960, uh, there were not that many Native people attending university. And the people that we admired most were of another vintage. There was Ella Deloria and Oscar Howe and uh, uh, Bee Medicine was just a youngster at that time. But she was also one of the, 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 the first, uh, uh, actually, no, the second generation uh, of Lakota people to be born on a reservation to actually attend a university. And we, we arranged to have Ella Deloria come and, and speak to us and we provided a, a little banquet and uh, anyway she gave us a very inspirational presentation. She, she and her sister Susie came in her old vintage car and uh, she was very grandmotherly, wearing her silk dress and her, her little sweater, you know, and a nice little scarf around her neck. And her braids were tied up around her hair, just like all the other in Lakota ladies on the reservation. They all wore their hair like that, you know, braids, and then they would wrap them up around their head. Anyway, she, <clears throat> she ended her presentation with, uh, first she quizzed everybody, do you, uh, you know, do you, do you speak the, your language? She says it's very important. She was a linguist. She had studied with Franz Boas at Columbia University and was actually quite famous at that time as an anthropologist and linguist. Uh, anyway, she encouraged us, gave us a wonderful inspirational presentation. And then um, she said, and my final advice to you is to know your relatives. Know your relatives. In knowing your relatives, you will come to understand your culture. In understanding your culture, you will find answers to your greatest problems. And then, she said to, uh, there was another, I heard it from another place, but then she said, and if you dearly love your people and wish to help them, grow where you're planted and care much always for the things that you care. And so when Ruth mentioned this evening that I could, be, could have been living anywhere, it's actually quite true. <laughs> but I made a very conscious choice to come back to South Dakota after I received my higher education and to grow where I was planted. Now, being a Lakota, that doesn't mean you're, <laughs> you're in just one place. I have <laughs> worked with Lakota people on the Rosebud Reservation, the Cheyenne Eagle Butte Reservation, the Standing Rock Reservation, <coughs> and the Pine Ridge Reservation. And that's because we have relatives on all those other reservations. So essentially, if you go and live and work there, you're, you're, uh, you're getting in contact and, and abiding with your, your, your distant relatives, see? And then, so most certainly, after World War II, we have what occurs, what, is, what can be called the Lakota diaspora. That is, the great departure of many native people from the reservation because of overpopulation, you know, and people after World War II had experienced the larger world. And uh, the population was growing. And so most certainly after the, um, after the, um, uh, 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 after World War II, many people, young people, left the reservation and they moved to the border towns of the reserva uh, uh, near the reservations, uh, all the reservations in South Dakota. Uh, for, for my people at Pine Ridge, that, me that meant Hot Springs and Gordon and Rushville and Shadron and Rapid City and Custer and Hot Springs and Hill City. 
Anyway, as early as 1946 and 47, there were many, many, many Lakota people who were bilocational. That is, they lived part-time on the reservation with their relatives. Then they would go work in the white communities. And so essentially, uh, the story of Lakotaness is one, uh, in, the, in the last hundred years, of, is one of the Lakota actually living in many different places. Prior to the 20th century, in the late 80s, as, well, as, actually as early as 1878, many of our young people uh, uh, were enlisted, as it were, <laughs> uh, inducted into educational systems in other parts of the country. As early as 1878, many of our, our, our ancestors were attending schools in Carlisle, <clears throat> Pennsylvania, Hampton, Virginia, Genoa, Nebraska, anyway, and, and Shalaka, Oklahoma, uh, Flandreau, South Dakota. <laughs> anyway, so our people uh, very early began experiencing uh, different parts of the United States. And to complement that, uh, you might say that they were not limited just to the United States, but after 1881, when Sitting Bull returned from Canada, and most certainly after 1862 in the Minnesota Uprising, many of our Eastern relatives, the Dakota, remained in Canada. <laughs> and some of the Sitting Bull people stayed behind in Saskatchewan in Canada also. And so we had we have relatives in Canada as well, and so people were going back and forth across the Canadian border. <laughs> and then the most dramatic uh, participation in, in, in different places was the native people who were enlisted, hired, employed to participate in the Buffalo Bill Wild West shows. And not just Buffalo Bill, but there were numerous other Wild West shows. And as early as, 18, as early as 1885, and most certainly for our people here at Pine Ridge, 1887 was the beginning of ad taking, uh, adventuring, <laughs> venturing into Europe. The first uh, Wild West show took place in England in 1887, returned for a year, and gathered more people, and proceeded on a grand tour of Europe, which lasted for two years in 1889. And oddly enough, the premiere show took place in Paris in 1889, at which time the Eiffel Tower was dedicated. Huh? And uh, the native people were there performing with the Wild West show and experiencing Parisian life. And uh, so as early, uh, and since 1887 and 89 and 90, uh, in successive years, right up until 1917, there were successive uh, Western life shows or Wild West shows that native people from all the reservations in South Dakota, from Rosebud and, 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 and Cheyenne Eagle Butte and, and Pine Ridge, uh, native people were traveling abroad and experienced the, experiencing the bigger world. And not only that, but those Wild West shows also traveled all over the United States to the major metropolitan areas. Uh, Omaha, St. Louis, Chicago, and Indianapolis and New York City, you know, many of our people performed in Madison Square Garden in New York City. And so native people, as we say, the Lakota, uh, particularly, you know, prior to the reservation, you know, traveled quite a distance, many distances over the Great Plains. <laughs> well, actually, we never did settle down completely is what I'm trying to say. Lakota culture has been evolving and it has kept on the move. And essentially that's one of the, one of the themes of my collage series. While South Dakota as a place 
is the place where we've been planted. Uh, you might say we're like creeping jennies or, or, the, or kudzo, that, 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 those vines that keep growing all over the place. Anyway, so we're not necessarily just of one place. Uh, but, but this is, in quotes, our ancestral home place. And the Black Hills are still considered our sacred ancestral place, possibly the place of origin. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, it's against this background that my, uh, my collages emerged. As Ruth said, I've had many, many experiences. Uh, and for the first 25 years of my life as a South Dakotan, uh, you know, in South Dakota, you can't make a living being just an artist. <laughs> you have to do other things. And um, so for the first 25 years of my life, I taught and, uh, at the university level and college level. And uh, my interests included anthropology, uh, the history and art of Lakota people, and then with extensive graduate work then, my studies took me to, to, to uh, becoming a professor of native art of, of all peoples in North America, from the West Coast to the Northwest Coast, to the east, uh, Eastern Woodlands, to the Southeast, to the Pueblos and the Navajos and so forth. And so my experience in um, uh, national, international native arts uh, also expanded to Mesoamerica and also to South America. And it's against that backdrop then that I earned my living for the first 25 years of my life. In 1985, I left university teaching and uh, taking the words of Ella Deloria seriously, I returned to South Dakota uh, to open my studio and begin making my living the way I really wanted to make a living, which was to be an artist. And uh, most people think you're probably crazy by that time, but 28 years of teacher can, teaching can do that to you, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, I, I, I opened my studio, and after having been through uh, numerous phases of, of, of art from 1960 when I first studied with Oscar Howe up until 1985. I experimented and, and did several series and actually all those shows that I did in those 20 years, every one-man show that I did was shown here at the Dahl Fine Arts Center mm -hmm. under the auspices of Ruth Brennan. So this institution has been instrumental in fostering my career for the first 25 years and um, actually uh, uh, provided the Western South Dakota venue for, for the shows that I did in the first 25 years. And um, so to, 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 to bring this part of the presentation to an end, uh, in, to, in 2010 I received, I received I actually received three Bush Fellowships prior to this last one. It was called the Enduring Vision Award. Only three of them were given, and you had to apply for it and write a proposal. And um, so I did that. And uh, uh, one of, a part of my proposal was to create, to create the, uh, the exhibition that you see. Those pieces have been gathered from museums all over the United States and from private collections. And those museums that would not give their, uh, couldn't loan their pieces for a, a full two years or didn't want to uh, loan their pieces once I told them the show was going to be shown at Pine Ridge, <laughs> they had misgivings about their pieces being shown on a reservation because they were afraid of security problems. And I thought, well, they really don't know the place. But uh, anyway, but there were other reasons why people did not want to uh, uh, lend their pieces. And so I had re 
singular reproductions made so that the exhibition, and this was a part of the proposal, knowing that this would happen. Anyway, I received the proposal, and um, I can tell you now that it's all over and gone with. It was actually $100,000. So what you do with $100,000 is create a, it, <laughs> the exhibition across the hall, which cost almost that much to, to just bring together all in one place, and also to publish the catalog, and to have the authors that are represented there uh, you have to deal with them, and they were willing to, to let their articles get republished. Anyway, so the, uh, uh, this is all an effort uh, of, of having received, but it was something I proposed and, and uh, I set about paying for it. <laughs> so uh, the little introduction that you're going to see now on the screen it was a part of the, the ceremony for where I went and received this award. And uh, it's a kind of a, a little retrospective that goes back to and covers the, the, the work that I did throughout my career. And then when this is finished, then I want to visit with you about the collages, okay? So I'm going to move to the side here and let uh, Katie do her magic. white man's art, still lines and things like that, you know. And there wasn't an opportunity for him to express his Indian uh, background, heritage, ideas, values. Uh, and so he came here for this two week long summer art institute uh, to work with Oscar Howe, who was and is, you know, the uh, you know, acknowledged leader of the Northern Plains contemporary fine arts movement. Uh, just having that man uh believe and say with assuredness that I am an artist, I am an American Indian artist, I am a Lakota artist. And he pronounced to us that you can be artists too. A major problem that Arthur had to have to face, how could he be contemporary at the same time? How could he, you know, pay tribute to his tradition and bring the two of them together? And he encouraged us to use our own heritage, our own artistic traditions, our own sensitivities, even our own language. Holding back Indian artists to kind of what people think Indian art should be has been a problem with the, for, that Native artists have faced for years and years and years. Initially, my first work were done in the style of my mentor, Oscar Howe. Because as a very young person, I was convinced that this is as he convinced us that this is what contemporary Native American art was about. Describing Arthur's work is complicated because he has done so many different styles using so many different approaches. And I had been through other phases, the Oscar Howe period and the abstract expressionistic period and the uh, modified petroglyphs and pictographic <coughs> period. And I was searching for something new to do. And so I became infatuated with the story of Standing Bear because he was the patriarch of our family. And uh, he was an artist, and he was a warrior, he was a buffalo hunter, and uh, he traveled with the Buffalo Bill Wild West show. And uh, but he continued to make art 
all his life, right up to 1933, the year he died, he continued to paint in the indigenous style. So it was then that I decided to utilize the original drawings of my great-grandfather or other ledger artists or Muslim artists and the printed word and uh, historic photographs. Uh, this was a, a radical new approach. No other native artists were doing this at that time. And composing them in, by that time, what I had perceived of as Lakota culture, American Indian culture, is actually a collage. It's made up of many time periods, and I thought of the experience of my own people. Having traversed the 19th century from buffalo hunting days to pre-reservation, to reservation, to traveling in Europe, to traveling throughout the United States, undergoing that experience, having to change their lives. You know? Their children were attending schools and bringing back with them the influence of the white education and blending that with Lakota traditions. And if you took those components and put them together all in one composition, it's a remarkable story of what these people underwent. Arthur has a really grand sense of humor, but it's the sense of humor of a quiet type. He's somebody who will give you a, a, something that's humorous that you need to think about, and probably on a couple of levels. So I think of the automobile as a representative of technology and culture and education, all the non-Indian forces and there is an expression called being taken for a ride. The entire Lakota culture was taken for a ride because they had to live on a reservation in one place, adapt to modernity, and still, of course, on their own insistence, retain their traditions. I guess in the long run, I, uh, I would like my collages to, to communicate to non-Indian and Indian audiences. The veracity of the, uh, of the human condition under stress. In other words, the Lakota people were confronted with either annihilation or adaptation. The great hope, you know, was the, was the expectation that Indian cultures would disappear. That uh, through uh, acculturation and assimilation, uh, someday there would not be Native American people, that they would be absorbed by the greater white society of this country. And that has not happened. And that's why I make my art, is to, to, to tell the story of, of, of my tribe, the Lakota, and other Native Americans, and the persistence of, uh, of tradition. And more often than not, this is part of this is the role of the artist. The artist throughout history has always been the ears, the eyes, and the voice of the culture. introduce the next part. Uh, there are several observations that I wish to share with you. Uh, the life of an artist or the, the work of an artist is one of the few professions that relies on the insightfulness of the artist, of 
aspects of his own life. Now the only other people that I know of who can make a living by thinking about themselves <laughs> are uh, uh, autobiographical writers. <laughs> but oddly enough, art is one of those professions that does rely upon the, the instrument that is the actual body of the artist. And we're talking about musicians as well as visual artists. We're talking about dancers on the stage. We're also talking about actors on the stage. These are all instruments. They are, they are not only people, but they themselves, their minds and their bodies, and the way these are used are the actual medium by which the art gets created. And uh, thus it is that I have chosen aspects of my own life juxtaposed against the history of those predecessors in my family, that is those ancestors, and the broader culture that they belong to. I decided in 1985 that after exploring uh, the, the numerous, uh, the Oscar Howe period, the fabrics and fiber periods, uh, I, uh, I focused upon the artistic traditions of Northern Plains tribes and the oldest of that art were petroglyphs and pictographs. And coming out of that tradition then, in terms of the, hist in the history of my own people, then coming out of that tradition was the painting on hides. And then when hides, when the buffalo were decimated, then the tradition went to painting and drawing on muslin cloth. And almost simultaneously with muslin cloth became the painting and drawing on ledger paper. Hence, you see the evolution of visual expression in the, in the, in the history of the, of the culture. First on carving on rock, then painting on rock, then painting on hide, then painting on cloth, and then eventually painting on paper. And then the ultimate evolution then occurred in the latter part of the, of the 19th century with our young people going to schools and learning to draw and paint on paper in the same tradition as non-Indian people. Anyway, in 1985 I decided, well, ledger art is very interest, interesting and no, no artists were doing much with ledger art, not in 1985 and 86 and 87. So I started, I began thinking about ledger art, ledger art, uh, the concept of a ledger to begin with because some of the earliest ledger art was done on used ledger pages that had writing with numbers on it and, and in, uh, writing and sums, you know. The concept of a ledger is to keep track of something, you know, to keep track of, of what was being spent and how much money was being taken in and how much was being loaned and in other words, it was a record keeping system. But it was not too unlike the winter counts, which I also became familiar with. I examined over something like 27 ledger uh, uh, winter counts. This was in 1981 and 82. And I thought, well, the winter counts are a means of keeping track also, if you know what a winter count is. It's a, cal uh, a history of a particular band or tribe and one image is made to, to, to commemorate a particular event in a particular year. And some of these winter counts go back to the, uh, to the early 1700s. And some of them, uh, the winter counts document the, the arrival of the horse, or, or when, when certain members of the tribes first came into contact with horses, and certain kinds of cloth. And they commemorate treaties. And I thought, well, ledger art, uh, uh, what, what the artists did once they obtained ledger uh, books after, 18, after 1870, 
It almost occurs simultaneously with the establishment of the first reservations in about 1870. And uh, they begin using ledger paper and ledger books as a means of, 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 of portraying the historical uh, narratives and events of their own lives and the lives of, of their family members, uh, much the same way as the winter counts had done. And so the idea of ledger paper and, and drawings on ledger, in ledger books and the ledger book style. The ledger book style is really not a style, that's actually a transportation of the old Hyde painting style and the painting style that was done on cloth. But somehow they call it ledger art now and it seems to be extremely popular. Anyway, it took off and I, I dare say I was one of the very first on the Northern Plains to begin doing this. And, um, and uh, it has taken off and has become almost global now in terms of the United States and in terms, it's all over the United States now and everybody and their grandmother and their grandfather and their niece and nephew are doing ledger art now, you know. And it seems to have, have reached a point where, where it is the established norm now of what they think of as contemporary Indian art. Uh, but the content, what one does in ledger art, uh, can be replicative and all art is either derivative, decorative, or didactic. That is, it's derived from other, the work of other artists or other tribal styles, uh, or it's purely decorative, meant only to be experienced because of its own intrinsic, exciting, aesthetic, uh, beautiful nuances or didactic, that is, it tells a story. And uh, I have been through all of these phases and I would like to think that my, uh, my, my own artwork is now all three of those things because composition, abstract composition is seriously treated in each of the, the collages that you see. If you, didn't, if you were an alien from outer space and didn't know anything about Indians or photography, and you were only accustomed to seeing abstract expressionistic art, you could, you could look at these things and see that, oh, well, those are kind of nicely composed, you know, without even imagining that it meant anything or was, was uh, represented anything. Okay, so the content, uh, as I said before, uh, my work is, is derivative, it's derivative from ledger art and photography and, and uh, representational painting and also, um, uh, phot I said photography, but graphic arts. Those of you who have been trained in, I mean there was a time when we received our educations, art educations, and we actually had to do lettering. <laughs> using a pen and ink and make posters. It was called commercial art. And you took that course and you learned how to do lettering and to do layouts to design posters and graphic arts to design pages of uh, fashion magazines and so forth. Anyway, the, uh, so the, collage, the collages as I do them actually represent all the, the media and all the coursework I've ever taken formerly in college. And, uh, but the content, uh, as I said before, is about my family. And uh, the images of the family do appear in the collages. And as I said, this was, uh, uh, this was my great grandfather, Standing Bear. He was born in, in, in 1859. He fought at the Battle of the Little Bighorn uh, at the age of 17 in 1876. In 1887 he traveled with the Wild West Show to Europe and uh, again in 1889 
and uh, begin in Paris, went to Barcelona, then to, uh, to Nice, and then Naples, and then Rome, and then on up. And he was injured while in Vienna, Austria, and stayed behind with this particular family. And, um, uh, and, and uh, he met and married this Austrian woman, Luisa Reinick, who was born in 1865. And he remained behind in Vienna, Austria with her family because he had been injured. And this also involves a great deal of research because I had to get into the archives and, <laughs> and uh, found out that Buffalo Bill left, left uh, there were three, two others that stayed behind and he left their tickets home at the American consulate in, in Vienna so that when they finally recovered, they could retrieve their tickets and return to the United States, as, uh, as he did in 18, February of 1891, after hearing news of the, of the massacre at Wounded Knee, where his, um, his first wife and baby daughter were murdered. He made up his mind at that time that he would return, but he would return with, with a new wife. A white woman, not an American, but a German woman, who would teach his future generations how it is that they would live and how they should provide them the lessons for getting along in the new world that he had perceived most certainly as a result of his travels in Europe and seeing the bigger world. He knew what was happening, was going to happen in the world back home. Um, initially, the homes on the reservation were small. Remember, people lived in teepees, and they were rather rudely built, but in time, the uh, uh, people were able to uh, uh, prosper and to build larger homes with windows. And uh, this is Standing Bear and his, his uh, German, uh, being the Austrian wife, and his first two great, his first two grandchildren. And here is a photo of them in front of their house. Standing Bear is on the far left, and his wife, uh, uh, Louise. And this is my grandmother my grandmother, Christina, and her first husband, uh, Thomas Tubanitz. Anyway, she was married three times. Her, husband, her husbands kept dying. It's not because she did anything to them. It was uh, tuberculosis and all kinds of diseases were rampant at the time. And uh, so this is her first husband. And uh, she's wearing the traditional garments. And Standing Bear and Louise became very prosperous because she taught him horticulture and animal husbandry. She taught him how to manage cattle and how to plant the gardens. And this teaching extended to members of the community, so the community in which they lived. Uh, the neighbors uh, participated in, in the gardening and the harvesting and the work that entailed making the great gardens and, uh, and, and herding the cattle. And they became very successful and as a result he was elected the uh, uh, chief of his community. And here he is wearing, wearing his, his shirt and carrying the chantojuha, the pipe bag, and the pipe that was indicative of leadership, every leader possessed such a pipe so that they could use it whenever they had a council. Okay. Uh, here he is in about 1930 uh, wearing his adorned shirt and, uh, and here are two of his daughters. They had three daughters. Uh, Christina was my grandmother. She was the youngest. Lily was born in, in 1896, and the old, their older sister was born in 1895. Uh, no, excuse me, 1892. And uh, she is not pictured here. This photograph was taken in 1960. 
And uh, Louise and um, Standing Bear died in 1933. And it was Christina here who inherited the home and continued the, the, the traditions, the traditions of, of being a leader in the community. She continued to provide produce from the gardens to the needy in the community. Uh, for indigent families who came, they could camp at the home place during the winter and be fed, and could be fed. And, um, and uh, her sister did the same up at Calico in, in near, near the Holy Rosary Mission. But as it was, it was from these two, or from this woman here, my grandmother, that, uh, and her ten children, <laughs> actually, she and her two sisters each had ten children, uh, and not all of them lived, but they each had ten children. And that was because, that was because, see, the typical Lakota family, the ideal family was four children in, in the pre-reservation days. And into the reservation period, the ideal family was four children. Many people didn't have four children. They, they, had, uh, they, they had more children, but the children kept dying because of disease and starvation. And um, anyway, uh, grandmother and her two sisters, uh, all of their children lived. Uh, there's an exception, one or two perhaps died, not my grandmother's. And so they, they had, she, Standing Bear and his wife had 30 grandchildren. And that was because at the turn of the century, if you know about 1900, 1895 and the 1900 census of the United States, not just South Dakota, but all of the United States, only 250,000 Indian souls were counted. That is, the population was only 250,000 Indian people left at that time, counted at that time. And Native people knew this. And uh, Louise, of course, was literate, and she could read. And, uh, and Standing Bear himself makes a comment when he's interviewed at the, about the Battle of the Little Bighorn. He, in his testimony, he says, we did not know what was going to happen, but we went ferociously into battle against these soldiers because we knew that if they killed us all at that place, at the Little Bighorn, that that would be the end, end of the Indian people. Anyway, so they had, a, they had uh, ideas about the diminishment of their own people. And so they very consciously begin encouraging their children to have more children, to have more, you know, so that the so Lakota people wouldn't die away. We need more people. Hence, grandmother and her two sisters each had ten children. And uh, I, I would like this evening to, uh, to introduce you to one of standing, the, the last of Standing Bear's 30 grandchildren. My Aunt Frida, will you please stand? Aunt Frida. She's 86 years old. She's the last remaining grandchild of, of, of Standing Bear and Louise. And then, of course, by 1942, this creepy little guy came into the world <laughs> and started keeping track. Now, I don't know how, why he ended up looking like that when his mother was so beautiful, but we'll go on anyway. And first grade in Custer, South Dakota. And was the first year in college at Northern State College. I was trained in a classical tradition of oil painting. Uh, painting, this is a portrait of Peter Catches, my mentor at Pine Ridge, which I painted in 1974. He sat for this, and it's done with oils and a palette knife. 
And here is another interpretation of a portrait of standing bear done in a, this is the kind of art, this is the kind of art you learned in 1960 if you went to art college, you learned these European techniques like this also. And then in 1960-61, as I say, I studied with Oscar Howe and our earliest works reflected work like this. Drawing from our knowledge of the indigenous culture. And then in 1970, I began doing some interpretive things from family photographs. Uh, well, I guess you kind of lost the head on this one, but, but uh, the thing I'm saying is I, I, I did adaptations of uh, historic photographs, and the reason I'm showing them is because I reused them in the collages. They appear again and again. It's a type of recycling, you know. Recycling is good, you know. <laughs> And as, as I said, in 1982, as a result of graduate work, I began examining petroglyphs and pictographs. And these are high impasto treatments. And at this particular time, I was also becoming familiar with the sacred traditions of the Lakota, in particular those on the Standing Rock Reservation. I was uh, uh, imported, you might say, by, by some of the elders at Little Eagle, South Dakota to help in the revival of some of their traditional sacred ceremonies. And a part of that, part of what I learned there was visit, visitations, as it were, to petroglyphic sites wherein offerings of tobacco and red paint were made and placed in the grooves of these petroglyphs. And then the memory of the images were carried back to the sacred Sundance and replicated on the sacred altar of the Sundance. Anyway, it show, tells us of the ongoing relationship of, 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 of contemporary native people with these ancient, some of these are 2,000 and 3,000, 4,000 years old and they were still recognized as belonging to uh, uh, our ancient ancestors. And so I took the, the imagery from those and experimented with those. And these were large four foot by four foot by six foot paintings and I think it was, must have been about 1981-82 when that exhibit was here at the Dahl. Ruth, Ruth engineered that one, and uh, I think there were 12 or 14 of these very large paintings. And um, and so in 1985, uh, with this kind of background, in 1985, I was also becoming familiar with the work of Standing Bear. Uh, locating large muslin paintings that he had done. And as you come in the door, there is a replica of one before you come into this auditorium. And it's images from those that I use in the collages as well. But this is a much larger one that was at the Institute, uh, Chicago Art Institute, which I discovered and uh, identified. Go ahead. And these are the images as they appear in the, on the muslin paintings done by Standing Bear. And I took some of those images in 1974 and did a modern adaptation of them in, in the style of Oscar Howe, that flat style. So I was experimenting with his stuff very early on, but not to the extent that we see now. And here are other images done by Standing Bear. These are portions of the Battle of the Little Bighorn. He has actually done about six major muslins, which are in the great museums of this country. And the catalog to this exhibition, uh, there's a whole chapter devoted to finding these particular muslin drawings that he did 
and uh, the, the notion of discovering them. In, they were unidentified before. They were done by Anonymous until I found them and worked with the curators and the art historians to verify them. Here is a scene on one of the muslins of the Sundance as portrayed by, by uh, and here's the buffalo hunt. And some of the first experiments that I did using uh, uh, ledger art, in this case, this was the art of Sitting Bull. And these are probably the first footnoted uh, uh, paintings, uh, collage paintings, because they are attributed to Sitting Bull and his life. And Sitting Bull's nephew, one bull, a white bull from Cherry Creek, did published a, a, a book where of his drawings, but he wrote in Lakota what the drawing was about. And that became further inspiration for my collages to include text. And so the earliest ones had started as documenting of my own life. And these are drawings that I did under the Oscar Howe, auspices of Oscar Howe. And uh, this doesn't show up so well, it doesn't show up so well, but it, uh, it, it's an image of, of my first teaching contract from the Sioux City Public School System. And then as I proceeded through, I began getting, through research, I began getting a broader view at the research, and then it struck me. I am going to deal with the history of the Pine Ridge Reservation and uh, how things were happening from 1870 until about 1930. I didn't go beyond 1930 yet because <laughs> I was interested in the historic period. And uh, go ahead. And so this particular piece, how many people have seen the exhibition? You have, I, uh, oh, well it makes great sense to have seen the exhibition because you can see all of these in their, in their great detail. Anyway, the, this particular one, which has, it has God the Father, Jesus, Queen Victoria, and a white couple all riding in the car with the angels holding up the wheels. Anyway, this, what, this was one of the first, and people standing aside observing all this. Anyway, this is where it struck me that the automobile becomes a symbol of all the new kinds of forces that Indian people were going to be expected to adapt to in the, in the modern white world. Huh? The technology, the automobile itself, uh, Christianity, a totally different view of the sacred and sacred beliefs. And uh, Victoria, in this case, represents British culture, you know. And whether you like it or not, as Americans, American culture is very much an, an ad, some kind of adaptation of British culture <laughs> in terms of the history of this country. And uh, so I began reflectively thinking that the, the, these were the forces that, uh, that we were encountered, and it carried over into uh, fashion. Indeed, vests, the beaded vests that we see are, uh, and quilled vests are, are not traditional tribal wear. They did not emerge among the cultures themselves. They came after the vest appears uh, as introduced by non-Indian people. Indian people did not make vests. Uh, the idea of the beaded vest or the quilled vest is very much an adaptation to a non-Indian fashion. Anyway, I thought the two guys up there, that's from a, a 1913 fashion uh, catalog of the latest fashions. I thought, well, if the Lakota did a fashion catalog, they'd look like the guys on the bottom. <laughs> and then hats and caps, of course, is, is another uh, innovation, the idea of what the westernization, native people becoming cowboys. Huh? 
the idea of the Stetson hat, uh, Levi's, and uh, the young people who went to school in the East coming back wearing more gentlemanly types of hats. Anyway, all of these became forces of, 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 of change. And then, of course, this one is called We Must Wear Clothes, and it shows people, uh, elders, adapting to wearing business suits. And then, of course, the young ladies who attended uh, on-reservation schools at, con uh, at uh, parochial schools were taught by the nuns how to crochet, how to embroider, how to do tatting, how to do all those domestic skills. And those that became literate, of course, imported, uh, they received magazines. And, uh, and this one is called, <laughs> we sure like those safety pins. <laughs> anyway, the whole idea of safety pins. You know, native, native clothes did not have buttons or buttonholes. And they did not have straps. Everything was tied or loose. And so once, once they begin wearing cloth clothes, uh, you know, they didn't wear hide clothes anymore, they begin wearing cloth clothes made of trade cloth and wool and calico and so forth. The whole adaptation to a cloth culture occurred and the technology of buttons and zippers and fasteners, you know, hooks and eyes and all that, all that was very foreign. Anyway, the ladies just loved safety pins. They could do everything, you know. You could do everything. You could tie your, put your shawl on you and pin it shut and it wouldn't blow off, you know. You could take a large size dress and, and fold it in and put a pin on it and make it smaller, you know. And men's shirts, you know, could be put on, pulled over and the neck closed with a safety pin. and and your, your Mackinac coat, you know, the button fell off, you, you could just put a safety pin on it. It was a revolutionary invention. And uh, then, of course, as I said, I began doing the adaptations of the great-grandfather using uh, uh, the images. And so here you see the uh, image of Standing Bear from a previous painting I did appearing. Uh, in a painting, and it says, when I pray really hard, I see my long ago relatives. In this case, they're the ghost dance, uh, people dressed up as ghost dancers peering into the sky. And it also says, in 1919, we stand on the threshold of a new and different time. We live in a wooden house. You know, the whole idea of adapting and changing and from a teepee to a wooden house was quite remarkable. And uh, here is another adaptation. It, it, the title of it is The Miracle of the Match. It's an advertisement for matches. And uh, it shows a Indian lady up at the top twirling a stick to start a fire. And, but it's really an advertisement for matches that you can strike to light the fire. But I also thought it was, uh, I thought it was a, a, a nice takeoff on Standing Bear and his Austrian wife. The miracle of the match, you know, how, how quite unusual that was. And uh, then the idea of advertising, including advertising, because it was the type of material that appeared in the magazines of that period. I do serious research so that all the, 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 the material that appears in the collage is of the period that I'm portraying. <laughs> okay, move on. And then, of course, as a result of the 1887 soiree in, in, in England, they had become very familiar with Queen Victoria because they did a command performance for her. She actually, it was her jubilee, and there were all kinds of visiting royalty in Europe at that time. And so they all came to the Wild West show. And uh, anyway, I must, I must tell you this. This, this is really funny. If, how, how, many, how many people have read the book Black Elk Speaks? Oh, good. Well, you know this. Anyway, uh, uh, later talks, they talked about um, uh, 
Queen Victoria coming in her coach. And she's just glowing, she's glistening. And the people are hollering, Jubilee, Jubilee. Huh? And, uh, and Black Elk says, oh, she just looked delicious. <laughs> well, you have to know, you have to think about this for a moment. Fat among the Lakota was a very precious commodity. <laughs> Elk and buffalo, you know, do not have that much fat on them. And, and it was very nutritious, and so in order to get fat, uh, when buffalo and hort deer and, and, and elk and animals were butchered, uh, they, they loved to get the kidney fat, you know, from around the kidneys and whatever other, other fat. And then the fat that, if it, there wasn't too much fat, they took the bones and cracked the bones and got the marrow out because it was nutritious. And so fat was a really precious commodity, huh? Anyway, so when Black Elk says, Queen Victoria just looked shiny and translucent. She just looked delicious, you know. He was comparing her to a, a big hunk of fat, you know. <laughs> anyway, the idea is she became, she became much beloved by, by the native people because she treated them so very well. Okay, let's go on to the next one. And, um, and then the series that you're seeing now are those that I did in, in I began in them in Paris, or when I lived near Paris. I received a Lila Wallace Arts International Fellowship and I resided at the home of Claude Monet for four months, at which time I did research in the uh, uh, Paris museums and went to antique shops, bookstores, went to the left bank to the stalls and got posters of the Wild West show and uh, paraphernalia or uh, memorabilia from when about Indians when they were there in in the 1889s and so forth and uh, one of the things that comes from the oral tradition of people descendants of people who had performed with the Wild West show was visits to the homes of, of, of foreigners, both English and uh, German and French people, when the show was not performing, uh, would go and, kind of like a library, huh? They'd go to the Wild West show and check out an Indian and take them, take them home for the weekend, huh? <laughs> and so they would uh, take several, you know, uh, a family or a group, you know, to these country estates. And I'm sure they didn't do that at Downton Abbey, but, uh, but, uh, but, but anyway, it's within the, the living memory of, of, of our people of having visited these country homes and people not wanting to sleep on the beds because they were afraid they might fall off and, and injure themselves in the night because the beds were so high. And then there's the incident of, of some not, they'd been in the city for so long and then they were invited to this home and uh, they just were not feeling very clean. Anyway, some of the bricks in the fireplace in the room where these people were staying uh, were loose. And so they pulled the chairs around and they took the, the wash basin, you know, the basin with the pitcher of water on it and they took the bedding and they covered it up over the chairs and they put the warm bricks in the, the porcelain basin, put it inside this little cupboard and they crawled in there and gave themselves a sweat lodge, I mean a sweat bath, you know, pouring water on the hot bricks to cleanse themselves because they didn't quite feel right in this establishment. Uh, anyway, so and, but then the things they ate, they would talk about eating certain things and the kinds of flowers that they saw. You know, they were very, they were very fascinated with the fact that that uh, Europeans love flowers so much. Okay. And so these are essentially scenes of them traversing the countryside. I'm sure they didn't have broadsides on their cars, but uh, there are okay then. 
Then this is one of my favorites. It's a composite of Rouen and Vernot and, and Giverny, where I resided. And the title of this is, is, is No One Was There. And the street looks fairly abandoned, huh? And uh, this has a personal story to it, but I transformed it into an observation by people visiting there a hundred years prior to when I was there. A part of my fellowship is I, I had a French tutor who came in once a week to teach me French. And I was not very adept at French. <laughs> and so I asked her, is, is it possible that uh, you can give me some, do you have any French anthropology books where I can learn about French culture? So she brought me these, she brought me these, ba these books and I, so I was reading it and, um, but simultaneously while I was reading these books, uh, I was becoming accustomed to living in a French village. Anyway, at nine, at, at, uh, at, at 12 or one o'clock, everything closes down and the people go home and they don't open again till about 4.30 or 5. And, and it's all, the places are just abandoned. So that's when we would go shopping for groceries because we get parked in the city square, you know. And uh, anyway, this phenomena of people disappearing, you know, the whole town would be, was like a ghost town because everybody was on their siesta. Huh? This is France. Anyway, I was reading this French book I was reading this French, uh, contemporary French anthropology book about French culture. And it said 75% of all French women have extramarital affairs. And 95% of French men have extramarital affairs. And I thought, aha, and I know when it happens too. <laughs> it's, from, it's during that break during the day. Huh? Anyway, so the title of this piece is No One Was There, and they're observing this, this French village. Okay. And then this, then, so there's there are the, the European things, and then there are these insights into life on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Of course, if you've ever been up to Redshirt Table, you can see the Black Hills from there. And the whole idea that uh, Standing Bear's relatives lived up at, Sta uh, at Red Shirt Table. And the whole idea of observing the Black Hills and the Plains and the Badlands from, from up on top up there and reflecting on how this was once, in quote, our ancestral home. And then the, the ongoing visits by other tribes to, to, to each other during the ensuing years from the beginning of the, the 20th century up in, uh, actually to the 1930s at the annual doings. The Crow people would come down and visit. In fact, Plenty Coos, the great, Sioux, uh, the great Crow chief, uh, uh, actually came down and spent time living at Standing Bear's place. Standing Bear would go up to Harding, Montana and Crow Agency as a part of the other delegations from all the other reservations who would go every year uh, at the anniversary of the Battle of the Little Bighorn, huh? June 25th. And the Crows uh, by that time were, were the hosts and so they would adopt each other. And, uh, and then Two Moons, the Cheyenne who participated in that battle, also spent time at, at uh, Manderson living with Standing Bear and then Standing Bear and his family would live with two moons when they went up to visit the Cheyennes. And so these are, this, th these are about those kinds of events, okay? And then the uh, early Indian rodeo taking place here. Uh, there's a, there's a, they didn't have chutes and they didn't have, uh, they weren't fenced in, the early ones, and I actually probably saw some of these, witnessed some of these, and those bulls got away, you had to run away from them or they'd get you. <laughs> and the idea of the churches, the influence of the churches, and, uh, and in, this, in this final one here, we see the, um, the uh, uh, almost a return to that Oscar Haas style of fragmentation, of geometricizing it, 
showing the inside and the outside of the interior of the church at St. Elizabeth's. And in the catalog, Janet Burlow does a nice discourse of this particular one and discusses its significance. But the years I spent at Standing Rock, there were simultaneously the descendants of one bull and white bull and, and dog eagle and flying by. These were warriors who had fought at the Little Bighorn, but who were also the contemporaries of that time who were preserving the ancient sacred traditions of the people. So the text on this says, even though that church over there, even though St. Elizabeth is over there, we still must remember to pray in our old ways. Huh? And so it speaks to us simultaneously of cultural continuity and also those years in which they adapted to Christianity. And this one is about St. Francis' mission at, at Rosebud, and it does much the same thing. And the one at Holy Rosary, uh, Pine Ridge, this one is commenting on the interiors of their churches were just like those from across the ocean and uh, the churches that were built on the reservations were gothic, huh? just like the ones that were in Europe that they had seen. And it says, our places of prayer, meaning the mountains where they went to pray and the teepees where ceremonies took place and the sky and the clouds, so our places, places of prayer keep looking the same. <laughs> and then the clash of two cultures uh, the scientific world represented by the map, the Christian world represented by the, uh, the devices in the middle, I can't go to those now, and then the, 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 the pantheistic sacred world of the Lakota represented by the Sundance. And it, in spite of all these changes, the traditions continue, and uh, my family continued to sponsor uh, sacred events, large feasts, and giveaways for which we wear our, uh, our accoutrements. And we celebrate the, the old ideals that were passed on to us by our uh, grandmother and her father. And uh, because of these, then, uh, because of this kind of transmission, and cultural continuity, this is what gives rise to the things that I call my collages. Thank you very much. <laughs>
my great grandfather was an artist, and I'm an artist, you know, and uh, and. Uh, I wish that my son was an artist, and I wish my nieces and nephews were artists, and some of them are. Some of them are scholars. <laughs> and uh, uh, see, there is, there's also that tradition in the family because of Louise. There was always a great respect for, for, for learnedness, for reading and, and, and writing, and uh, a love of, of those fine things. Uh, but my family all became practitioners of the traditional Lakota arts. Beadwork, uh, fabric arts, quilting, huh? beadwork, some do quill work, uh, the idea of embroidery, designing, fashion designing, working with hide, painted rawhide. Uh, these are all the arts that I grew up with because just about every member of the family in some fashion or another I had uncles and aunties who drew in the dirt and then drew on paper as a matter of facility. Huh? You just did it because that's something that you do. And so essentially, uh, we're all living a part of our, our familial legacy by practicing these arts. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much again for coming out this evening and I'm sorry I went over, overboard. But that's what old men do. <laughs>